I think uh, our next speaker, uh, Grotem, will um, touch on another aspect uh, which begins with society, in fact, not with leaders, and uh, will tell us more about uh, four moments of mobilization in Delhi. Uh, they're all urban movements, uh, urban political movements uh, that are grounded in the city uh, as a context. That's right. Good morning. Um, first, let me say uh, it, that it gives me a tremendous sense of this personal happiness. I have been trying to come to Cairo for 10 years, um, and I bought three different tickets. I got two different visas, and I once almost got deported at the Bombay airport, but that's a different story. Um, but I think it, you know, things happen when they are meant to be, and uh, no one more than Kyrenes know that things happen when they're meant to be. So I'm... Um, I'm going to take the title of this conference very literally and selfishly. I will learn a lot from Cairo. I may not be able to give back, and for that, uh, my apologies, but I will try. Um, I wanted to do something very different. Um, I was trained as an urban sociologist. I have a, a doctorate in planning, but I actually am an activist. It's the only thing I've ever been. Um, I have been, I study what are called slums, a word that I never use, um, and I wish Mike Davis would stop. Um, I have been part of anti-eviction social movements in India, and particularly in my city of Delhi for many years. So what I'm going to try and talk to you about today is think about the title of our panel about urban political change as literally change where people gather in public space to demand it. So to look very much at processes of political change, thinking about what it takes to gather and begin change from below. Um, and I'm, I'm very glad that Omar in the morning spoke about urban citizenship, because I think to me this is very much about, like Mohammed said, a question of not just belonging to the country, but belonging to a place. And I think that in many post-colonial countries, our framework of citizenship has been national. We were Indians. We were Indians because we were meant to be Indian because the national development story would take us all along. And the 50s and 60s was really a story about, um, you know, people who write about displacement in India say the word displacement was never used in the 50s and 60s. Because even if you were moved by the state, you believed you were moved in the interest of a nation to which you belonged. Um, and I think that there is a certain breaking of that post-colonial imagination of development. And what I want to do is to locate the fact that our protest movements, our mobilizations, are happening in a very particular political and economic moment. And to think about their success and failure, and to think about the strategies we use, it's necessary to understand that protesting in 2012 is not the same as protesting in 1992, and not the same as protesting in 1965 because a very different, and this is what I'm going to ask is, a very different set of actors is on the ground. They're asking for a very different set of things. And whether or not their claims are being heard with empathy is also determined by a very different set of factors. Um, I'm also very glad to be here because one of my teachers in college used to say is that when you sit and talk about the city from New York, you make theory. When you sit and talk about the city from Cairo, you give testimony. Um, and it has stuck in my head because it's true. Um, and it's not just that our town planning guidelines still come from 1950 British town planning manuals like they do in India, but it's that the geographies on which knowledge circulates, the way we know and understand our cities, also come from a lexicon of theory that we did not inherit, that we inherited but did not create. So the ability to create theory from the South to ask questions, um, and I'm very happy to, ask some, to hear someone actually question whether or not dual cities exist, because when I went to school, you were taught them as if they did. It was very clear. I am apparently come from a dual city. Delhi is meant to have two. It's also fascinating to me to hear you talk about public health, because um, Delhi's first master plan was commissioned by the Department of Health, not the Department of Planning, um, and commissioned by a grant, ironically, to the Ford Foundation in 1951. Right? And four planners who had never been to Asia came and built the first master plan for my home city, and I will leave it at that. Um, so here's what I want to do in my time. I want to make two propositions, and I want to tell you four stories of moments of mobilizations in my city. And I want to leave a provocation to you as Kyrenes about yours. Um, so I'm going to play the dirty academic trip of asking you a question and not answering it. 
and leaving it on the last slide so you can't do anything about it. Um, so here's my first proposition. I think that it is worth remembering what began in Tunisia a couple of years ago and the very particular incident that was actually about an individual man who was a street vendor who was complaining against police harassment. And I say that because when that moment occurred, that moment of Mohammed Bouazizi, it was a story that had such echoes in every Indian city that we looked at and said, this can be us. This is us. Every day, this is us. So the question of thinking about what this revolution was, and too often, I feel like the moment in Cairo was thought about as a political revolt against a dictatorial regime. Of course, it was that. And of course, it was much more than that. Because to me, I think when you think about a protest that begins from unemployment, from the absence of work in the city, one of the things that you're saying is that there are two strands of injustice here. The first is an economic inequality. And the second are the indignities and injustices of everyday life in deeply hierarchical and stratified societies that are partly undergirded by economic inequalities as much as they are by political injustice and lack of access. So the provocation, the first provocation I want to ask is to think about what it means to think about how we can, if we can, understand both the political and economic context that lead to our revolts. The second is to say, to learn from Cairo and think about India, is to say that democracies manage inequality and protest in different ways. But they manage them the same way. And thinking about how inequalities and protests are understood and legitimized in different political structures, I think is a very important challenge that we must ask. And not to reduce the Cairo moment as a moment against a dictatorship, but to recognize that protests in a democratic, ostensibly democratic country like India are very similar in their structure. So the four stories that I want to tell you are a tale of two protests and two mobilizations. The first is a series of protests by residents of informal settlements. The word that we use in Hindi and Urdu is basti. Basti comes from the word basna. It means to settle. Right? So a basti means a settlement. So it is, it is the word that I will use in place of the slum. And the protests of bastis that take a very recognizable form, right? Uh, India has a long tradition of taking to the street. And that tradition is particularly a tradition of social justice. And it's a very recognizable tradition in political science, which is that in a developmental welfare state, the poor, as citizens, make a claim to the state saying, you must be responsible for me, that you cannot shirk yourself of your responsibility to house me. Right? From 1990 to 2007, in much of my work, I have documented 217 evictions in 17 years in Delhi alone, evictions that have displaced and broken the homes with to imagine what an eviction feels like. And I want you to imagine what it takes for a democratically elected government to be able to take a bulldozer and break the homes of the city's poorest and displace 1.3 million people in 15 years and not lose power. This is where the struggle comes in understanding these history. We were taught in school about patronage and populism and the poor are vote banks and in democracies they negotiate with the vote in order to say if you don't protect my illegal informal settlement I will not vote you back to power. We were, talk, we were talked about clientelism, we talked about patronage. What happened to clientelism and patronage when 1.4 million people were evicted from their homes? What happened to the world's largest democracy? And what happens then to the ability of the fact that these protests met no year willing to listen to them. We lost these battles time and time and time again on our streets. In a contrast, when the government tried to go after illegal shops held by traders and business owners, and I want you to remember these are not rich traders and business owners. These are your corner shops, the shops behind the house, the shop on the extra third floor of the roof. Some of them, yes, are large malls built illegally on land. But many of them are actually a range of different kinds of shops. A different kind of protest took to the street. And what that protest argued, actually, was the emergence of a new kind of citizen to which the state was willing to listen. So suddenly you see a very different profile of people who stand not, not coincidentally outside the National Human Rights Commission, arguing that the breaking and bulldozing of shops that violated the master plan may be legally correct, 
but is a violation of the fundamental promise of the Indian constitution and the Indian state to protection under the law. Okay? Now, I want to translate these two signs for you, because what's really interesting to me is what they say is, if you seal our shops, my kitchen will be bare. Right? And the other one says, if you seal our shops, how will I feed my children? These are precisely the slogans of the poor. These are precisely the slogans of need and welfare as claims from the state that over decades, large numbers of poor people in Indian cities have used to get benefits and resources from the state. What does it mean for middle class and elite households to claim need, poverty, and hunger, take the slogans that were taken from the movements of the poor, but occupy the same streets. Right? What it means is that you had an entire set of protests that led to the government not just reversing large parts of its ceiling orders and stopping the deconstruction of houses, but giving compensation to illegal shops that were demolished in violation of the master plan. So you had a machinery that when traders and shopkeepers protested, moved into place, gave protection, and said the reason why shops are illegal is because the state did not build enough commercial space. Well, what the poor had been saying is the reason they live in illegal bastis is because the state did not build enough low-income housing. Right? Two parallel arguments, two exact structures of claims made to the same state, one that sees empathy, echo, and action, and one that remains ignored in an inversion of the classic politics of mobilization, where it is the elite who get the year of the state, but not in the way they did earlier, not through access to power networks, not because they're sitting in the hallways. It is the elite who are taking the same methods of occupying the street right, that the poor have always done. And that's what's changed in our particular moment. Elite control is no longer in control of the state. Elite control is through control through popular and public mobilization. So what does that mean? for the fact that political change and political mobilization and the image of thousands gathered on the street is not always the voice of the oppressed or the voice of the marginalized. Sometimes it is also the voice of power. I want to suggest two frameworks to think about this. One of my great mentors in India, a legal theorist called Upendra Bakshi, said he hated the word poor and he hated the word poverty. He said the words poor and poverty are passive. They describe a state as if the poor have always been poor, that they were born poor. And he said, the people are not born poor, they are made poor. And that process he called impoverishment. And he defined impoverishment as an idea, as a set of processes and actions by which it was considered legitimate and just that some people remain poor. And what I want to suggest is one of the challenges in the new political moment in Indian cities, in the new economic moment in Indian cities, is that in the new developmental model, where the state no longer is willing to bear the responsibility of the poor, what you have is the impoverishment of the idea of poverty itself, which means a claim to poverty no longer translates into a claim for protection. How then do you ask for change? The second question is a very interesting move where elite middle class citizens have portrayed themselves as the truly vulnerable in our cities. Pollution affects us. Traffic affects us. Our houses are weak. Our businesses can't expand. We don't have enough malls. The third brand of Puma has not yet reached Kyrian supermarkets. We demand this right to a new life. Now, it's, it's almost, I mean, it sounds joke. It sounds like a joke, but when we went to the court challenging evictions, middle class resident associations in Delhi went back and said, we have rights too. We have the right to walk in a park. We have the right to walk by a river and have a corniche. We have the right to a healthy environment. We have the right to a dignified life. We have a right not to live next to poor people. So what you have are competing claims of rights saying they don't have a right to occupy my park. They don't have a right to build a temporary shack here. They don't have a right to take back my quality of life. And they are claiming that they are the citizens that they are the new urban majority. So the entire language of democratic mobilization, where the majority poor would shame the state, is a language co-opted by an elite saying, we are the vulnerable taxpayers, we are the small citizens, we are the ordinary, we are the everyday. And it is this new urban majority that has looked for new objects of change. 
So our largest mobilization was something called the I Am Anna movement. Anna Hazare is a Gandhian who fought for Indian freedom, known for a very strong moral, ethical, I would say fascist, but many people would disagree with me, a sense of how one should live life, who started one of the largest anti-corruption movements in India recently, and I'm sure many of you heard about it, a movement that brought out thousands and thousands and thousands of people onto the streets of Delhi. And again, for the first time, it brought out the middle class. So the language in Indian politics around mobilization today is the middle class has risen. It has taken back political space. It has taken back the street. But what's interesting about this new mobilization, and you can see this is one of India's, Delhi's largest gathering grounds, and you know, at, the, at last count in, that, in his meeting, he addressed 275,000 people um, on our version of Friday morning. Um, you know, and they came just as early as all of you have. And I think what's really fascinating about this is that at one moment, we all looked at this and we, were, we said, what is this? And it is one of the, my friends looked at me and they said, is this Tahrir? Yeah. And none of us knew what to make of it because it didn't look like any mobilization that we recognized. It was a demand to end corruption. We understood that. But it was a demand to end corruption from a set of middle class actors whose understanding of corruption was so particular to their economic life. They wanted lower level policemen to be punished and jailed. They wanted the small petty bribes at every street corner to be immediately criminalized. And we were stuck in a position where no distinction could be made between the corruption of businessmen and government contractors who made millions and the corruption of a petty traffic policeman who made 10 rupees off a single transaction. That we were unable to distinguish between the corruption of the rich and the corruption of the poor as if there was no difference between the two. We were made to pretend that the consequences of corruption for the businessman who made two million on a deal instead of one million were the same as the, as the corruption that a poor resident in an informal settlement had to pay to get subsidized sugar from a public fair price shop. And the inability to separate those two led us to a mass mobilization that to me felt like the impoverishment of poverty. It felt like the claims of a new urban majority. And it split many of us in progressive movements down the middle. Because we were not on the street where we, were used, we felt we should be, but we didn't know how to be there with these new claims. It was also, I'll just close in a minute, it was also, I think fascinatingly, very much the, the promise of the new generation in Egypt is, is fascinating to me because it was largely a youth-led movement. It was very much about a new generation claiming a new space. In India, of course, numbers are easy to conjure up. If you think you have a population problem, you should try ours. Um, and, the, the, and the last thing I want to say, though, is, and this is my note of optimism following Khaled, is that another protest happened, however, very recently in Delhi over the last three months following the brutal rape and murder of a girl, which brought the city out in very different ways. And I just want to leave you with some images of these protests because what they do is, they, and all the, the buildings in the back are, are, are the House of the President and our Parliament. So it very much was a protest that for once, we have two main streets in, in, in Central Delhi. One is called Janpath, the path of the people, and the other is called Rajpath, the path of the king. And the Parliament, of course, sits on Rajpath, and the protests all happen on Janpath. And so one of the, my favorite slogans about these set of protests is, is they said, um, the slogan said, uh, Janpat se Rajpat tak sab sarke hamari hai, which is from Janpat to Rajpat, all these roads are ours. And it was a mobilization that was unlike, I think, that unsettled even this moment of what brings people out to the street. And I think what was amazing about it was is that it had a visceral sense both of coming across class, coming fighting between the my skirt is not responsible to I look like what you think a good Indian woman looks like and both of us are here in a way that had not happened before, looking very much also to a state that did not know how to handle this mobilization and turned to this crowd, as you'll see equally large in some ways as the anti-corruption crowd, with water cannons. For the first time in Indian democratic history, which led almost to the resignation of the chief minister and an instantaneous apology, but they were water cannons. 
leading in a sense sense of mobilization and protest that, that unsettled in a way that we still have not understood. But what I want to leave you with in these images and thinking about, I'm going to leave you with the one that I love the best, right? which is um, the new generation of Indian women who have a lot to say to the government. Um, you know, and one of the things that both these movements asked for, and this I think is where the parallel to Egypt is really powerful, and I promise this is my last sentence, is that both these movements sought new laws. They sought stronger institutions. They sought a heavier-handed state. One wanted an anti-corruption bill that would create an authority so powerful that, yes, it could check corruption, but it would be like the third version of the God King. It would be undemocratic. The third, the criminal law amendment bill that was passed recently, sought death penalty for rapists, sought firmer, stricter, harder punishment. Many of us in the women's movement for many years argued that the death penalty was no deterrent for rape, that it would only make conviction rates fall even further. But my point is that both of these movements sought to move away from what they perceived as a softer democratic state to that dream of all Indians, which is a benevolent dictatorship, a firm-handed, powerful government that would fix it and set it right. And the Cairo 2050 master plan is planning's version of that firm-handed, powerful government that will rewrite the city in its way. And that appeal to be Singapore, to be Dubai, to be Shanghai, is not just an appeal to look like them, it is also an appeal to be governed like them. It is an appeal to be governed with force, to avoid the messiness of democracy and protest. And that appeal comes from a presence on the street that is not of the poor but of the rich, who feel that the firmer hand will work in their favor. So my question to you is what are the ways that, that Egypt's new and possibly more democratic, I was more hopeful when I wrote this, political order will negotiate legitimize and reproduce the political and economic inequalities that have birthed it. That if you took to the streets for unemployment, what are the ways in which the new structures that have come will legitimize and reproduce that unemployment in your name, as all our movements are co-opted in our names? And how do we understand the new logics by which exclusion work in a post-Mubarak era so that we may oppose them for their actual functioning and not have slogans that we were shouting in the 80s that no longer can be heard in the 2000s. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Grotem, for this very powerful presentation and uh, insight into India, which I think, in, in, you know, one, one of the main points that I forgot to mention is the the hunger that we have here in Cairo, or a lot of people seem to have in Cairo, for another perspective, a South-South perspective, which is really what this uh, panel is about. Uh, you know, in light of everything that's happening, we hardly get enough of uh, coverage or analysis or understanding what's happening in India and South America, uh, in Africa.